Live, where you tweet your questions for a chance for me to answer them on my next live show. So I have so many great questions for you today. And from all these other topics like the molecular orbital theory, we have kinetics with integrated rate laws, the Arrhenius equation, and a stoichiometry uh, word problem. Now this is all $100 worth of tutoring that you are getting completely for free. So, so happy you could be here. And I wanna see who's in the chat. So if you're here, let me know. I see I have Shivani saying, hey, thank you for helping. Your videos are so helpful. Thank you, I'm so happy they're helpful. And Tim saying, first time catching this live stream. Nice, I'm happy you can be here, Tim. And then he says, uh, Melissa, your videos have, have helped make chemistry approachable. So happy, guys, really. And then uh, I also have, Rohit saying, how are you? I'm doing well, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I hope you guys are doing doing really well yourself. So I also see uh, Kiri saying, yay. Tony's saying, can you go over the mole? So I'll be going over a little bit of stoichiometry towards the end. Um, and of course, if there are any other videos or notes that I have, I'll let you guys know to help you, you know, continue studying. All right, guys, so, so happy you all can be here. I see so many people coming uh, together. So awesome. I'm doing well. Thank you, Gaming with Ryan just asked. So what we're going to be coming going over is a little bit of general chemistry one and AP chemistry, um, AP, yeah, AP chem. And then also I'll be going over a little bit of the second half of general chemistry two. If you're in that class, uh, it's like a college class. And I know AP chem also goes over this. So that's exactly what we'll be covering today. All right. Uh, so if uh, for everybody actually who's just joining me now, and if you're not really familiar how this show works, how this live stream works. Uh, pretty much what I want you to know is that I already have the questions pretty much asked already or chosen uh, from Twitter. So if you want to get your questions answered, a chance for them to get answered for the next live, make sure to tweet me your chemistry question. You could either take a picture of it or just tell me, hey, I need help with, uh, you know, molecular orbital theories or stoichiometry. And make sure to tweet me at hello Melissa M and use the hashtag Ask Melissa Maribel just so I can easily find it. And then I will choose a handful of questions to then go over. And it's actually on the screen. That's how you can tweet me. Uh, I'll go over, let's see, the next Sunday. And I highly recommend that you tweet me before Saturday because I actually make my lesson on Saturday early, early that day. Okay, so definitely do that, guys. I know more people are starting to do that. And I'm answering as many questions as I can. Okay, so on the screen, these are all the topics that I will go over in this order. And if you're watching the replay, I will be pinning a comment at the very top with the timestamps, just telling you exactly where you need to go for that specific topic. And let's start off. Let's start off with molecular orbital theories. And now with this type of topic, there's going to be two main diagrams that you need to know. So it depends on your professor or your teacher. Um, I've actually seen that you do have to memorize this. At least that was my case when I was taking this class. Um, but and some of my students also had to memorize this. Unless your teacher will give you the template or the diagram, then you're lucky for that. And I would say if you're not sure, just ask them, see if they will provide it. Uh, so these two diagrams are a tiny bit different and I'll point out why they're different and how. So it's gonna be dependent and it's actually gonna be right here. So what the molecular orbital theory is doing, this is still going back to electrons and where they're placed in their orbitals. And it's also gonna be a tiny bit of electron configuration and that's all gonna come together to help us understand what's really happening, um, how stable this, this molecule is um, and then based on like the electrons. So I'll explain that a little bit further once we kind of dive into it. But for now, let's just understand the two differences between these diagrams. So for the first diagram on the left, we'll see that this is for boron, carbon, and nitrogen, right? We see that on the bottom. Now, the main thing is we're going to see some things like, oh, we have some uh, bonding orbitals and antibonding orbitals. How I know this is anti is just the fact that it has that little star or asterisk. So that's telling me that it's antibonding. And then we'll see that same thing up here. 
Okay, so just letting you know, understanding those two differences there. So the next thing is that you'll notice that we're going to have 2s and 2p, and that comes back to the electron configuration of whatever we're finding. Like if we have nitrogen, which we'll do an example of it, we will do the electron configuration first and then start putting all of the electrons in their proper orbitals. All right, and then next you'll note that this other diagram on the right is oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And these almost looked exactly alike, except the main difference is right here, where our pi orbital is actually a little bit lower on the left than it is on this side, right? Now, the reason for this is based on the energy. So it's based also on the fact that oxygen and fluorine, here I'll show you, that oxygen and fluorine and neon are a little bit further to the right. And this is essentially stating that since we're further to the right, we actually have more electrons, right? We can know that as well based on the atomic number increasing. So the fact that the atomic number is higher on the right side, then that's telling us there's going to be more electrons because the atomic number tells us how many electrons there are, same with how many protons there are. So in this case, I know that boron, uh, carbon, and nitrogen is more to the left, so that's not as high up as in energy. And I know that with my with my pi, that's going to be stronger. So this goes back. I know there's so many little factors here, but remember that sigma. This is sigma, by the way. That sigma is essentially talking about single bonds, and then pi is talking about any higher bond like a double bond or a triple bond, all right? So that's, that's why I know that, okay, pi must be higher because there are more electrons, and this is telling us how it's increasing in energy. So that's the main, main difference that I do recommend you know. Um, I have seen that actually on exams, them asking, like professors asking you, why that's the case and that's actually why just the fact that this has more electrons and it's higher in its energy all right so let's do an example so let's say if we were asked to write the molecular orbital diagram of n2 now before we start one one actually we have to identify the correct molecular orbital diagram which was this first one right this was for for nitrogen here we go this was for nitrogen on the bottom now what we have to do first is actually do the electron configuration and figure out how many electrons we're dealing with. So that's what I'm going to start off with. So I know in here, let me go back. So let's just start off with going back to the electron configuration and how to do this. So let's write this out. Okay, so the electron configuration for nitrogen, let me go back, there we go, nitrogen, is going to look like this where I'm gonna start off with hydrogen and make my way to 1s2, right? This is 1s, this is 1s1, go straight across, this is 1s2. I'm now gonna come back around to the second row, and then I see this is 2s2, and I'm just trying to get to nitrogen, right? This is just going back to the electron configuration. Now, next, we're at the P block. So the P block, this is still in the second row, so this is 2p, but nitrogen, we have to count how many electrons we get until we get to nitrogen. So we have one, two, and three, and we're done. So that's the electron configuration. Now what I'm going to do next is just identify what's our highest energy. And what's our highest energy is dependent on the highest coefficient. So meaning our highest coefficient, and coefficient just means the number in front, then I know that that's going to be two. I don't care about the 1s2. That's something to know, right? So 1s2, I'm not really, it's not the, it's not the highest s um, orbital. Instead, our highest s orbital is 2s2, okay? So I'm just focusing on these electrons. So I know, okay, 2s2 and 2p3. And then now that I know that, I'm going to use that to build and fill in all of the, the diagrams. All right, so, so far, that's what we have. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Let me bring this back and just state that we know, okay, this was, let me put it up here. This was 2s2 and 2p3. That's what we were focusing on. So if we'll note here, so look, looking at the bottom, the reason why I separated this is because everything on the left Everything on the left and everything on the right is just telling us it's just one nitrogen. That's it. But everything in the center then adds up together to give us that molecule of N2. So essentially, that's what we're doing. We're pretty much just 
writing out or drawing out an orbital diagram of just nitrogen like we typically would for our uh, electron configuration. And then we're putting them together in the center to create that molecular orbital or yeah, molecular orbital diagram essentially is what we're doing. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill this in where I see that, okay, I have two electrons and I'm just gonna start with filling the, the left side. So this is one and two, okay? And then from here, I have three electrons in my p orbital. So because I have that, now I'm gonna fill this, but notice how I'm gonna fill this, all right? So pay attention to how I'm gonna fill this because it's very important. It's something called Hun's rule. And I always see students um, kind of fill this the wrong way. And th this is easy to kind of mess up and lose points, but I don't want you guys to do that. So how we're gonna fill this is electrons want to be alone, essentially. They don't want to be in the same um, orbital, really. So think of it this way. If we have three different electrons, how we're gonna fill this is individually, where this is one, two, and three. All right, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't fill this as one, two, and then three. We wouldn't do that. Instead, each individual orbital gets one electron. Okay, so that that's would be that ah, that is what we would have for the first nitrogen, and then I'm going to mirror this on the opposite side because it's the same exact thing, right? Looking at the bottom, I see that nitrogen is on the left side and on the right side, and nothing's changed. It's just the exact same thing. So that's what I'm going to do again. Let me go back real quick. We'll get to bonding uh, bond order in a second. So I'm gonna do the, the exact same thing where this is one and two, all right? Because I had this these two electrons in our s orbital. And then for p, I have that same thing. So one, two, and three. Okay, so, so far, that's all we're doing. The next step to fill the center is just to add everything together. So what I'm gonna do is just, I have two and I have four. So in the middle, I'm just putting four electrons. So here I have one and two, three and four, and that's completely full. I'll do the same thing for this uh, 2p portion, where this is three electrons, three electrons, I have six electrons, right, three plus three. So six electrons to work with in the center, and I'll start with the bottom. So I'll, I'll fill this using Hun's rule. So one, two, three, four, five, and six, and that's all I could do, that's all I could fill. All right, so let me know if you guys have any questions so far on how I'm feeling, how I'm figuring out this uh, orbital diagram. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do, there's something known as bond order. And essentially what bond order is telling us is telling us, is this stable? Is this molecule stable? The higher the bond order is, the more stable it's going to be. The lower the bond order is, the less stable it will be. So let's say if you had a bond order of like zero, that's going to be very unstable. Okay, so just to let you guys know that. So what we're going to do with our bond order, this goes back to me talking about the bonding electrons and the antibonding electrons and understanding which one's which because this is how we're going to figure this out. So our formula is this. Our bond order is the bonding electrons subtracted, so subtract that from antibonding electrons divided by two. So remember, antibonding is really just the one with little star. Okay, those are, those are the electrons that we're looking at. So here we didn't have any, we just had two. So let's just start counting uh, how many bonding electrons. And by the way, just a little note, for your bond order, we're only paying attention to the center. We don't care about the, the left and the right side. That's only used to fill the center, okay? That, that's really the molecular orbital uh, diagram, essentially. So what I'm gonna look at are the, our bonding electrons. And here, the bonding electrons are the ones that don't have that little star or asterisk. So in this case, I have two, and let me actually circle it. So two, four, six, and eight. So bonding electrons, I have eight. Next, I'm gonna subtract that from the antibonding electrons. So the ones in the ones uh, that actually have that little star. So the only thing that I have are two right here because this one had that star, right? We can see it right there. This one had that little star, so that's just two. Now I'm gonna divide this by two. So this is really six divided by two, which gives us three. And then we'll see that here. So our bond order is three. Now, the next thing that they'll ask you, besides this being a bond order of three, which by the way is stable, it's very stable actually, then they could ask you, is this paramagnetic or diamagnetic? And what that all means. 
So paramagnetic is telling us it's unpaired electrons. So meaning we have at least one electron that doesn't have a buddy, right? Doesn't have a pair. So in this case, this wouldn't be the case because all of our electrons, and once again, we're just looking in the center. We're just looking when we're being asked the bond order or paramagnetic, diamagnetic, you are only looking at that center portion. So this would have been diamagnetic because everything is paired, right? Every single one of these electrons is completely paired. That's why in this case, it would be diamagnetic, not para. So I, I know, like, sometimes I kind of feel like, why did they name this? Why do they name it paramagnetic when it sounds like it's a pair? But really, this goes back to Latin where they're saying it's dia, so di meaning two. So that's what you kind of have to think about, knowing that di means two, so it had to be two electrons, meaning it's paired. Okay, so we'll keep doing more examples of this. Uh, I'm going to do another two examples just so you understand what to do when we have charges, whether it's a negative charge or a positive charge. Okay. So let's keep going. So that was just the first one. Now I'm gonna build off of this idea, okay? So I'm still using the same sort of, think of it like the same sort of template where we had our electron configuration, right? Where we had N2, actually just nitrogen, had an electron configuration of, and I'm just looking at the highest ones, 2S2 and 2P3. There we go. I don't care about this 1s2. I'm only looking at the highest energy, uh, and that would have been our 2s2 and 2p3. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm, I'm going to fill this in accordingly, and I'll deal with that negative charge in a second. So let's just refill this how we how we did before. All right. So how we did this before, where I had two electrons here and three electrons on either side, and I'll do that same exact thing. And then I'll, I'll fill that in the center as well. So for our P's, this is going to be a six. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. And then from here, where this is going to change is just the fact that this has a negative. And remember, whenever we have a negative charge, that means we're actually adding electrons because electrons are negatively charged. So electrons are negatively charged. That means I'm going to add one more electron to this center portion and to one of these portions, meaning you'll know, looking, looking at the bottom, so I'm going to have you look down here. All right, so looking down here, I know, I know that this side is the only one that has that negative. So when we're representing this, before we had that this was N and N since this was a neutral molecule for our previous example. Now that this is charged, since it has a negative one charge, I'm placing that on just one of the nitrogens. And that means this side is gonna be a tiny bit different and I'm gonna add one more electron. But also I'm gonna have one more electron to work with in the center. So I'm just adding one in the center as well. So I'll show you that. So adding one more electron just on the right side, that means I would have placed an electron here, and I now have more electrons to use on either side, right? I have three plus four, and now we have seven to work with. So that means I have one more electron here. So that would be the proper uh, diagram for something that has a negative one charge in this case. Now, let's figure out if this is stable. Let's see, you know, and, and by the way, what you could actually you're asked this a lot um what i honestly see a lot of times with these questions on exams is they're asking you which one is the most stable and they're giving you the one that's neutral the one that has a minus charge and a positive charge so that's actually the question that i'm doing now and i'll show you which one is the most stable and how we're going to determine that again is due to looking back to our uh, bond order so i'm going to figure out our bond order so our bond order, remember, goes back to our bonding electrons. So our bonding electrons, we have two, uh, four, six, eight. So, so far we have eight again. Anti-bonding electrons, we have two and three divided by two. And we'll get five halves, which is 2.5. So 2.5 would be our bond order. So, so far, because this is less than our previous case, which remember our previous case, case was just N2 and it had a bond order of three, three is higher, making it more stable. Remember the bond order, if it's a higher number, it's going to be more stable. If it's a lower number, it's less stable. So in this case, it's not as stable as our previous case. Now the next question they would ask you, and once again, we're just gonna look at the center portion, 
is they're going to ask you, is this paramagnetic or is this diamagnetic? And remember, paramagnetic means that there are unpaired electrons. And here we'll see on the top, yes, there are unpaired electrons. So this needs to go, right? This, this is the only one, not leave, sorry, but this needs to be the case where it's unpaired electrons. One more thing with this, though, is they might ask you how many unpaired electrons are there? So there's only one, right? There's only one unpaired electron because this is the only electron that's by itself. So that's what you would answer in that case. Let's do one more example of this. And now we have something that has a positive charge. So this has a positive charge now. And what I'm going to do, I'm still going to do the same thing. It's like I use that N2, like the neutral molecule. I use that as a template and then I build from there. And I see, do I have to add an electron? Do I have to remove an electron? All right. So that's going to be personally the easiest way that I have found and my students have found to do it this way. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So once again, I'll bring back that nitrogen, uh, its electron configuration, was that 2s2 and 2p3. And I'll draw this again. So this was 1, 2, 1, 2, this filled, right? Just doing the same exact setup. This had three electrons, three electrons, three electrons. And then one little note here. So because, because looking at the bottom, this is a plus charge. A plus charge essentially means that we're actually removing an electron. Because an electron is negatively charged and we're adding a proton essentially, that really means we're removing an electron. So in this case, I'm only going to rewrite this like, like the, the left side is still going to stay the same as nitrogen, but the right side is going to be that N plus. And by N plus, I now have to remove this last electron. So that's what I'll do. That electron's gone. All right, so that's essentially what we're talking about. And now we're going to fill the center correctly, where this we only have three and two to work with. So we only have five electrons in this middle portion. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, and five. And that's where we stop. So the next thing is going to be figuring out our bond order. So our bond order, let's do that again, where our bonding electrons are two, four, six, seven. Okay, so we have seven electrons. How many antibonding? Well, we only have two. And once again, we have five halves, which is 2.5. All right, so that's 2.5. So that's what we have so far. It's the same exact thing, right? So those two are, it's not that they're not stable, but you're going to be asked which one is the most stable. So our neutral molecule is actually the most stable since it had the highest bond order of three. And in this case, by the way, if we're asked once again, Let's pull this back up. So if we're asked, is this paramagnetic? Is this diamagnetic? Well, there is one electron here that's left unpaired. So it had to be paramagnetic. Magnetic. So in this case, this is another example of paramagnetic. So I hope that's making some more sense with our molecular orbital diagram. This is a very common question, actually. I see this all the time on exams. So definitely no if not nitrogen, I'm just saying this style of question where they're asking you, you know, which one is the most stable and they give you three different options or even two different options. And it's just your bond order that you're essentially looking at. All right. So I hope that's making some more sense. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, and we're going to go into integrated rate laws. And then by the way, everyone who's um, asking for a different topic, uh, how this actually works and how these live streams work is essentially you guys actually ask me ahead of time, like the week before you tweet me your questions and I will answer them. You have a chance to answer them the, the following Sunday. So the reason why I'm doing this is just so I can answer more questions than I could before. Um, and I wanted to make this more topical. So so I can explain a lot more rather than just one question at a time. Um, so yeah, that's essentially the reason why I'm doing it this way. But in the, the chat, I also left how you can tweet me your questions. And I highly recommend doing so. Uh, the people that are getting their questions answered, I'm sure, are obviously thankful that they tweeted me ahead of time. So make sure to tweet me before Saturday because I pick all the questions on Saturday and I make my lesson. Okay. So let's move on. Let's keep going to the next topic, which is our integrated rate laws. So everything that you're seeing on the screen, um, all my integrated rate laws, 
Those are the most common ones, or actually those are the main ones. Now, um, you might see the formulas a tiny, a tiny bit different where I'm going to show you here. What I'm going to use for first order is essentially just another way that we could have written this initial formula, okay? So this initial formula. Now, now essentially, um, what I want you guys to know, and by the way, if you check the description box, I have all of the formulas. I have a formula sheet there for you. It's, a, it's free, so make sure to check that out um, because I do have General Chemistry 1 and 2 formula sheets for you if you haven't downloaded that already. So essentially, these are the integrated rate laws that we will be using. I will specifically be using the first order and this type of uh, first order. And then something else to mention with integrated rate laws. A lot of times I know that students, um, have trouble understanding like when do I use the actual typical rate law and when do I use the integrated rate law? You know, like what's what's the difference here? So integrated rate law, your biggest clue is going to be the use of time. Okay. So if if they're asking you, oh, find the rate or find the concentration at this given point in time, and it actually gives you like hours or seconds or minutes, then that's hinting that you will use the integrated rate law. Okay. So time is your biggest hint. And the reason for that is because it's in every single formula, right? Time here, that's in our, our overall formula for the zero order, for first order, and second order, and so on. So that's going to be the biggest differentiator to figure out when do I use this overall? Um, and then just in case you also see Half-Life later, which I'm not going to talk about today, but uh, Half-Life, if you were to see that, they will literally say uh, Half-Life or they will give you the decay constant or some some sort of form of decay. Okay, that that's another little hint for Half-Life. So continuing with this, there's actually different graphs that I highly recommend you know. Uh, we will go over one example later, I believe, um, that does have a graph. Yes, we will. So it does have a graph. So essentially what I want you guys to do is to know, understand how you can just instantly see a graph and know what type of order it is. Okay. So what I would look at or have you look at, this is for zero order. So for zero order, we have our concentration of are of some of some sort of reactant, right? A would be some sort of reactant. Now, on the the x axis, that's always going to be time. So it's our concentration versus time. So now, uh, or time versus our concentration. Now, another thing is the fact that our slope would be negative in this case. And you'll note here our relationship between that is that our slope for our zero order is negative, same with first order, but second order, it's positive. So that's going to be an easy way to figure out um, how we can just instantly tell what order it would be. All right, so this is one way to look at it. Another thing for our first order is paying attention to how this would also look like, where this is the ln of our concentration of our reactant. And then this wasn't, right? Zero order didn't have that. It just had the regular concentration. And then once again, this is still our line that's going down, and it does have a negative slope. And then lastly, here for our second order, our, it's a completely different uh, line, really. It has a positive, it has a positive slope. And in this case, we'll see that this is going to be 1 divided by or over that concentration of A versus time. So the reason why I'm showing this is because I, I've often seen like that you're given an actual question where they're just giving you like one of these graphs and you're asked to figure out is this zero order, first order, or second. And this, this Y axis is actually your biggest hint. Same with your slopes. Okay, so knowing knowing that will instantly pretty much tell you whether this is second order, first order, or zero order. All right, so now that we kind of see that, and something else that I wanted to mention um, is I wanted to mention that, uh, this, I think I talked about it a little bit, where we you can actually download all of these formulas and so many more formulas. Uh, actually, all the formulas that I will be covering today are in the description box, which I highly recommend checking out and getting. Uh, it is a completely free formula sheet that you can download. It is in the description box. Another thing that I wanted to mention that's also in the description box towards the bottom is uh, different links that I personally recommend. So what 
you'll find there is something called Chegg Study. I personally really liked it. I used it all throughout college. It helped me with not only all of my chemistry classes, but my physics and math classes uh, since I was a chemistry major and I had to take a lot of those types of classes. So what Chegg Study is, it is think of it like a homework helper, where if you are stuck on a homework problem and you don't understand you don't understand it and uh, you want to see more of like the step-by-step explanations, that's exactly how you can use Chegg Study. Now, it is not free, but I do recommend it. It personally really helped me a lot. And um, if you would like to, to get more information, uh, the link in the description box will take you there. It is on the bottom. Just a little disclaimer, um, if you do purchase, I am part of the affiliate program and I do get a commission, just meaning I do get something for it that obviously goes to my channel and I make more videos from it. So that's essentially it just helps make me make more videos. Just want to let you know that. But still, personally, I did use it. I always want to, you know, say something that I actually used myself or I do recommend. So anyways, besides that, let's keep going on to the first question for integrated rate laws. Okay. So in an experiment, the initial concentration, and you know what? I'm going to stop for a second. And the reason why I'm going to stop for a second is because... I want to explain uh, what each constant means, okay? This is going to be very beneficial when we're figuring out all of these word problems. So before we get to the word problem, let's just identify what this means, okay? And like what every single one of these terms actually stands for. So if we're given, let's say something like this, what this essentially is telling us, it's telling us that it's the concentration of reactant at a specific time. Okay, so that, and once again, that's what that's how we know it's an integrated rate law because it gives us a specific time. So this is just the concentration. I'm going to say concentration, right? Let me actually just put it. It's the concentration of our reactant, okay, at a given time. And that's why you have T. And then next, our K is just that rate constant, okay? So K is our rate constant. And then next, our T is time. And something else that is going to be very helpful to know is this one specifically is our initial concentration. All right. So this is just initial concentration. Concentration. That is something that's going to be really helpful to understand. OK. So now that we know that, let's keep going. All right. So. First things first, let's read the question and we're asked, uh, we're told in this experiment, the initial initial concentration of this was, was given. So this is our molarity, right? Concentration is measured in molarity. If the reaction is first order with the rate constant of this, so we know this is our K, what is the concentration of this after 2.5 hours? Okay, so one, I know that this has to be the integrated rate law and which one specifically, well, they had to tell us, right? Or else we wouldn't know what formula to use. So, and also another thing is if they don't give you any like table of data or they don't give you any sort of graph, then there's no way of figuring out what type of order it is. Like, like if we were just given this uh, question and it didn't tell us it was first order, zero order, or so on, okay? So in this case, um, what I want you guys to look at is just the fact that this says it's first order, okay? So this is first order. I know what formula I then need to use, and we'll go over that. Now, the first thing that I want to do is just identify what every single thing is, all of our given values. So our given values were all of these. We're told us that our initial concentration in the beginning was this molarity. Our rate constant was this. And then here, our time is 2.5 hours. Okay, so that's 2.5 hours. Um, and then I just see a question about stoichiometry word problems. I will cover that at the end. So now for our time here, this is 2.5 hours. Now, something to note is that since your rate constant is in seconds, right, that's seconds to the negative first, your time has to be in seconds. So beware of that. You will need to convert this. So how I'm going to convert this time is this goes back to, let's say, if we're converting 2.5 hours and we know we know here that one hour is equal to how many minutes well that that equals 60 minutes 
And then now I have to keep going and say, all right, well, I want to get two seconds. So let's get from minutes to seconds. So this is one minute is equal to how many seconds? Well, 60 seconds. And then from here, that's actually exactly how I got that 9,000 seconds. Okay, we'd multiply straight across. And because we saw that our hours cancel, minutes cancel, and we would get that amount of seconds. So now that we have that given amount, now we know our formula. So this is the formula that I will be using. And once again, this is specific to first order. So I'm just going to plug everything in because I have enough information and I want us to see what are we solving for. We're specifically asked for what the concentration is after a certain time, meaning we're looking for A sub T, okay? So we're looking for this top portion because we're given our initial concentration, which will be on the bottom. We're given our rate constant and our time, right? That 2.5 hours converted to seconds, which is 9,000. So we're just looking for this top value. And I'll plug everything in. So here I just plugged everything in that we were given. We, we saw that this was our initial concentration, our rate constant, and it's negative, and then our seconds. And the reason why we wanted it to be seconds, so our seconds and seconds can cancel. And then from here, all I have to do now is actually do the math. So on the right side, after you multiply those two values together, you get negative 0 0.198. And then I'll keep going. And what I have to do since I'm trying to, and let's, yeah. So what I'm trying to do, let me bring this back. There we go. So we want to get rid of ln. And this goes back to a little bit of math where our, where our ln needs to cancel. So if ln needs to cancel, I have to take the e of both sides. So I'm going to take e of both sides, and that's going to instantly cancel out my ln. And that's what happened. That's actually exactly what happened here. And then now I'm raising, this is my new exponent, and I'm raising that here. So this is e raised to this new power. And then from there, I'll plug in the math. So I'll plug this into my calculator, do this value. And essentially, since I'm looking for this, I have to multiply both sides by that denominator. All right, so multiply both sides by our denominator. And then uh, just a little rule of thumb, whenever you're plugging this into your calculator, make sure to do this portion first and press enter and then multiply it by whatever else you want to multiply by, which in this case is this value. So after we do that, actually, I really did that perfect. So after we do that, this is what we get, which is on the bottom. There we go. So after we multiply these two values together, right, this is what it gave us 0 0.82, multiply both sides, multiply those two together, and this is, oops, this is what we would initially would have. So this is telling us that our concentration of this molecule after 2.5 hours is going to be this molarity. That's our concentration, and that would be it. So essentially, with these types of questions, it's just knowing what formula do I use? The fact that this told us that it was first order, I knew, okay, had to have been this one. Could you have used the other uh, formula that I showed before? Yes, you could have. Okay, that's not a problem. I just thought this one might be a little bit simpler. Um, but either, either or. And then next thing is to always make sure that your time is in seconds because your rate constant is going to be in seconds. Okay, so let's do another one. So now we're actually told, let's read this question and see what we're given. So the reaction is first order. So once again, we have first order. In an experiment, the initial concentration, so this is our initial concentration, and then after heating it, we have a new temperature for 455 seconds. So luckily it already gives us it in seconds, so we don't have to convert anything. And this is essentially telling us that this is what happens after. So Think of this as our second concentration after a given time, which was the 455 seconds. So based on this information, determine our rate constant. So remember, our rate constant is K. So we're looking for K. Let's write down everything that we're given and the formula that we're finding. So we're given this amount, and I, I think I forgot to put the seconds. So remember that T is also 455 seconds. Let me make that a little bit nicer. 455 seconds. Okay. So we have pretty much everything we need, right? Everything is, we have our concentrations. We have our time in seconds. Check. All we have to do is solve for K since they're telling us that we're looking for our rate constant. So in this case, I'm just going to plug everything in. 
All right, so plugging everything in, and I pretty much just kind of replaced this so you guys would understand what everything is, you know, meaning here, where this is essentially once again telling us the concentration of whatever reactant we had, and right, this is our reactant, and at a given certain, you know, time that they had. So this was exactly that case where this is our concentration of our reactant at that given time of the seconds that they provided. And then on the bottom is once again the concentration, the initial concentration, that zero just means initial. So now what I'm gonna do is plug in all of the values and I'm looking for K. So after I plug everything in, all I have to do is divide this. So what I'm gonna do first in your calculator, I would actually, before doing the LN, I would divide these two values, press enter, then take the LN of that, of that answer, okay? Uh, the reason why I do that is just just so you don't get a syntax error or what that means is the calculator can't, like it just says error or it doesn't read it or it gives you the wrong answer. So that's what I would do first. And then this is essentially what we'd get. I would then actually take the ln of that value, which is this. Next step is divide these two over. So I divide negative 455 to both sides. And this is, this is gonna give me my k value. So this would be my rate constant, and my rate constant will be measured in seconds to the negative first. All right, so, and then, the, by the way, if you're not sure why it's measured in seconds to the negative first, if we were to go back here, this is seconds, right? And and let's say, and let's say there was actually an S here telling us that that was seconds. When I divide this over, and I'm gonna show that here, when I divide that over, our seconds is now on the bottom, and S to the negative first actually means one divided by S. So that's how, that's how I knew that it's going to be seconds to the negative first. And that would be our rate constant for that. Okay. The Arrhenius equation. All right. So the Arrhenius equation is going to vary. So we could either have any one of these three variations for the Arrhenius equation. And once again, this, this is all coming from uh, the, the formula sheet, the free survival guide that I have linked in the description box. So make sure to check that out and download it because all of these formulas that you will need for both chemistry one and two are there. So a lot of times what we're gonna see is we're gonna try to figure out um, what we're going to use, like which formula we need to use. And it's going to be dependent on one, what are we solving? And two, how much information are we given? And the reason I say that second part is because looking at this second equation, this has multiple K values, this has multiple temperatures, right? But this one here doesn't. So if we were only giving, given one temperature, then we'll use this formula. If we were given two temperatures, then we're given, then we're going to use this formula. So we'll see two different examples using actually this formula and the other, just so you can get a better feel for it. So another thing that I wanted to mention is just the fact that you do have to understand what E sub A is and what all of these terms essentially are. So let's go over that. So E sub A is called activation energy. And what is that? So here's a little diagram just explaining what it is. Now, activ activation energy is essentially the energy that is required to get to your products, okay? So, so think of it from like, this is our here, this is our energy and this is just the progress of our reaction. So in this case, we have our reactants and they're, you know, they're going away. And here, this is essentially saying, how much energy do we need for this to then form our products? And another, another way I like to kind of think about it uh, visually is think about it as you're climbing a hill, right? So we're going on a, hi on a hike right now and we're right here. And if we're going on a hike and let me draw a little stick figure. Okay, so that's us. <laughs> we're going on a hike. And in this case, we're basically stating how much energy will it take for us to reach the destination that we want, which essentially are the products, okay? So how much energy will it physically take us to actually climb up that hill or walk up that hill and get to that final destination? That's what activation energy is, the energy it requires to take from going from reactants to the products, okay? So that's essentially what you will be, I actually see that a lot, you'll be asked what is activation energy. You will also be asked to find, to find it, I actually find the numerical value. So continuing on, what is A? So A is the frequency factor. 
And then next we'll get K. Well, K we said before was our rate constant. And then R, this is, uh, this is actually going to be a specific constant that we will use. So knowing that this is, this is the one that we will use is going to be very important. Uh, just a little side note. And I believe you should be given this, that rate constant as well. Yeah. I, the formula is something that I don't think you'll be given, just in case. But as always, if you're not sure, always ask your professor if like what you actually will be given on an exam and what you have to just memorize. Okay, let's do an example. So we're given this whole table and it has a bunch of information, right? It has a bunch of temperatures and rate constants. So those are our Ks. Temperatures, again, and uh, we also have another trial. So we have several different runs that we had. And this is telling us that, okay, we collected uh, a bunch of data, determined the frequency factor. So frequency factor was that A, an activation energy, E sub A in kilojoules per mole for this reaction. So whenever you're given this, and by the way, you will see this most likely in lab. Um, that's why I wanted to include it. But if you were given something like this, you would then input it into a graph and graph this out and figure out your trend line. So, and by trend line, I really just mean the equation of the line. So I already, already did that for you. And let's say if we put everything on an actual plot and graphed it out, this is what it would look like. Now we have to see, okay, if I were to then highlight the graph and pick, you know, show trend line, uh, then this would actually give me that specific line or, e or equation essentially. So this is going to be very beneficial because the Arrhenius equation can be used just like a slope intercept form. Like uh, this is kind of like going back to math, right? So in this case, this is the one that I'm, I'm personally using right now. This is the Arrhenius equation. And the reason why I'm doing that is because this is the, the main one that's going to resemble the yx, uh, y equals mx plus b type of formula, which is our slope intercept form. So what this would look like, this would be our y, this would be our m, remember m is our slope, this would be x plus b, where m is going to be our slope and B is going to be our y-intercept. So that's why here you're going to see the same thing, and it's already labeled, where this entire number, this entire number here, not looking at the x, is our slope, and this entire number, 26.8, is our y-intercept. And the reason why this is going to be so helpful is because all we, all we have to do, essentially, is to figure out what our A and our activation energy is to set these two equal to each other. So if our M is actually equal to this value, and we also know this is this value, or actually this, this expression, we're going to set those two equal to each other to figure it out. And I wrote that here. So once again, M is equal to that negative E sub A divided by R. And what I have to do is set that equal to our slope value. So this is essentially what I'm doing. I'm saying this, I'm setting that equal to our actual slope value. And this is my equation. And now I just have to figure out what our activation energy is, which is that E sub A. We know what R is, right? We know that R was that 8.314. And all I did here, by the way, was I multiplied both sides by a negative R to get rid of this negative and get rid of that r. And then we know that r is actually this value. So once we once we multiply those two together, we get this amount. Now, the next thing is they wanted this in kilojoules per mole. So kilojoules per mole, all I have to do is actually divide by 1,000 joules per every one kilojoule, and that gives me this result. So, so far, that is my activation energy, 93.1 kilojoules per mole. The next part is a little bit simpler, where in this case, ln of a, right, ln of a is actually my y-intercept. So ln of a, I'm going to set those two values together. Right, that's what I did here. And all I have to do to figure out what a is, since that's the frequency factor and that's what I'm solving for, is I just have to take e of both sides. So raising this, e of both sides, this cancels out, and this is essentially going to be I, yeah, perfect. I have it here. So then this is going to be our new exponent for that E. All I have to do is plug that into our calculator, and then this is our value for our frequency factor. So that's how you would read this on a graph. Uh, like I said, this 
can this be a test question? It can. I also see this most commonly in uh, labs. I uh, just wanted to provide it because I know that can be tricky in lab. So that's a common case for this. And let's do one more Arrhenius equation and get to uh, a stoichiometry word problem. So now for this one, we're going to use a different type of format, and I'll tell you why in a second. So let's just read the question and see what we have. So at a temperature of 701 Kelvin, the rate constant is given, and at a, let me help you follow along, and at a temperature of 895 Kelvin, we have a different rate constant. Find the activation energy. So this is a very common question, by the way, that I have seen on exams. So what we know is we have two different rate constants. We have two different temperatures. So what formula do we have to use based on all of this information? Well, that's what we have, right? We also know what R is. This is the formula that we will have to use. Okay, so we know that's what we're using in this case. All I have to do is essentially plug everything in. So that's what I'll do. I'll plug everything in now that I know my formula. And I'll just show you where I pulled everything again. So our K value, and remember this is going to be, oh, I think I flipped these. Um, oh, no, I didn't. K2, K1. I think we're fine. Um, and then we would plug everything in. And then essentially, here, we divide these two values. And then this would give us 5.40. And then next, once again, I'm just going to do this separately in my calculator. So with these types of questions, it tends to be a little bit simpler towards the end because once you know what your formula is, you just plug it in. Right, that's pretty much it. You just plug it in. So that's actually exactly what I'm doing here is I'm just plugging everything in. Um, something actually that I just noticed, yeah, I used a different formula, which is really the same thing. But another formula that you can use is K2 divided by K1 equals, ah. either formula you use would be correct. Uh, this would be T1 minus T2. Yeah. Both are correct. Okay. So that's actually the one that I used here. But but just to let you know, this one here is also the same thing. All right. So that's also the same thing. No matter if you, like, you flip these and you switch these, you're still going to get the same answer. So I'll plug everything in. We'll get our answer. And essentially what I'm doing... Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm going to divide these two values. I'm going to divide these two values, and that's going to give me this answer, and then E sub A. And the next, this, the next thing I'm going to do is just divide both sides by that value. That's going to give me the E sub A, but that's going to be in joules per mole, not kilojoules per mole, which is what I need. So I have to divide this by 1,000, and this is going to give us our kilojoules per mole, and that would be the final answer. So once again, just knowing... Um, what our formula is, when we're going to use that formula, and so on, and always paying attention to your units because if uh, if you would have stopped at joules per mole, unfortunately, you would have been docked some points because th they wanted the answer in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that was the Arrhenius equation. That was it for kinetics. Now I'm going to get to, I have time for one more question for the stoichiometry word problem. Um, this is something that I haven't done yet in my videos, so I wanted to do it here. So for everyone asking for a stoichiometry word problem, uh, I'm doing one right now. And then I'm also going to provide you with, I have a lot, I mean, a lot of resources and videos and notes all on stoichiometry. So I know I'm only going to have time for one question here, but I do have a whole playlist that's dedicated to stoichiometry. So I highly recommend watching that. Um, I also have, if you guys don't know, I make my own digital notes. And what I want you to think of it as, it it helps you shorten, completely cut in half your studying time. Okay, so instead of having to try to understand the entire chapter of your book, what I have already done is I have pretty much condensed everything down into a packet of notes where I've seen these are common questions and it's everything that you personally need to know to master that stoichiometry topic or other topics. So I highly recommend checking that out. I just put it in the chat right now and it's, it's really helpful. Uh, I always also like to include different exam questions that I've seen over the years, whether it be from my own personal exams or my students' exams. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out just because 
teachers tend to recycle their questions or have that same sort of, you know, type of question. So yeah, that's going to be in the chat right now. Okay, so let's do this question. So stoichiometry. Now, it's going to be very important to understand how to get from grams to moles, moles to moles of different compounds or molecules, and how to get to, in this case, we're not going to need Avogadro's number because there's no atoms, molecules, particles, or um, formula units. Okay, so for this one specifically, it's saying what mass of SB is contained in 106 grams of SB2S3, okay? So they don't give us a balance equation, and we don't need it, actually. So because they don't give us a balance equation, we'll figure out what we're going to do from there. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see, okay, what am I given? What am I solving for? And how can I basically bridge that gap to get to what I'm solving for? So what am I given? Let's, there we go. I'm given 106 grams of this entire portion, okay? So I'm, I'm given grams of SB2S3. I'm trying to get to mass, and mass essentially just means grams, right? So mass means grams. So I'm trying to get to the mass of SB. So I'm going to keep going. And how do I get to grams of SB? Because we can't just instantly convert those two. Instead, what we have to do is we have to get to moles. So a little hint to you guys. So whenever you're doing stoichiometry and you have no idea where to start, I highly recommend to just convert to moles. That's your first step. That's pretty much always your first step. And the reason for that is because every single conversion factor for stoichiometry actually equals moles. So because that's the case, because that's the case, I can just instantly know, all right, my first step has to be to convert to moles. So that's what I'll do here. My first step will be going to moles of SB2S3. Okay. And then next, what I'm going to do is since I know I have moles of SB2SB3 or S3, then I'm trying to get to a completely different element or compound or something else, right? So since we're completely changing the element, then I have to do a mole to mole ratio. So I'm trying to get to moles of SB because I eventually want to bridge the gap and get to grams of SB. And that's always going to be the case, by the way. Whenever we're trying to convert from grams to moles, we will use the molar mass of whatever we're finding here. So for this one, it would be S SB2S3. Whenever we are trying to completely change the element, the molecule, the compound, we're changing something, then this is going to be a mole to mole ratio. And I'll show you how to find a mole to mole ratio. So I typically say that the mole to mole ratio is found in your balanced equation, which is true, but this doesn't give us a balanced equation. So this is a great example of what do I do if I don't have the balanced equation, but I do have enough information actually, and I'll, I'll show you guys why. So, and then finally, the last one, by the way, would still be a mol the molar mass of SB, just because we're going from moles to gram. So grams to moles, moles to grams, we're always going to use molar mass, changing moles of compound A to compound B, or molecule A, molecule B, that's going to be a mole to mole ratio. So let's start setting this up. There's going to be essentially three conversion factors. All right, so setting this up. I'm going to start off with just our first information. So our given information was just that 106 grams, and that's why I'm placing that here. The next thing is we always want to align the units so they can cancel. So in that case, I must have the exact same unit on the bottom so it can cancel. And that's what I'll, I'll see here. Okay. And then what I'm going to do, and you'll see that in a second, so I will put grams of SB2S3 here. How I'm going to figure out what that is, what that number is, is by finding, as we said, the molar mass. So we have to find the molar mass. How do we find that? So remember, the molar mass is the sum of the in, of each individual elements all together, okay, all added together. That's essentially what we're doing. So I need to know what is, and I'm looking, by the way, I'm looking at my periodic table when I'm doing this. Um, I'm going to see how much of each element we have. So I did that already. So this is SB. We have two, right? The subscript tells us that there are two of that element. So that's why I had to place that two there. Multiply that by the molar mass or the overall mass of 
our uh, what we actually find on our periodic table. So this is what we found in our periodic table for SB, that is the mass of it. Multiply those two together and we get this value. We'll do the same thing for sulfur. So for sulfur, there's three of sulfur, there's three sulfurs, correct? Because we have that three subscript here. I'm gonna multiply that by 32.07 since that's the mass of sulfur on our periodic table and that gives us this value. Last step for this is just to add these two together. So adding these two together, this is essentially what we get. And that's the exact number that we're gonna see here. So that's how I knew what to use first. All right, the next step is remember molar mass. So the unit for molar mass is grams per mole. What this essentially is saying in this case is this is saying this is our grams is actually equal to one mole of that SB2S3. Okay, so then here we have one mole of SB2S3 and that's on top. So in this case, SB2S3, what's gonna happen is this is gonna cancel. Grams and grams will cancel. And now we're at our second step, which is right here, which is our moles of SB2S3, okay? So then next, what I have to do is I have to figure out, okay, where, where, where am I gonna get that mole to mole ratio? So where I'm going to get it is actually hidden here. So here, let me, let me put that over here. SB2, S3, okay. I'm just looking at this overall chemical formula, right? I'm just looking at it and I'm seeing how many SBs are there? Well, we, we said that there's two of them. So I can literally just look at the chemical formula if I'm not given a balanced equation and say there's two SBs for every one mole of this entire compound. So that's exactly what I'm gonna state. I'm gonna state that on the bottom there's one mole, why? Because we always want the same exact unit to be across from each other because we want them to cancel out. And then next on top, I'm gonna state that, okay, we, we have two moles of SB. Okay, so this is two moles of SB, which is gonna be on top. And then now we're, we're getting there, right? We're almost there on our last step and we're finally gonna get to the mass or the grams of SB. So the next step, or the last step essentially, is gonna be doing just that. Once again, we want the same exact thing to be on the bottom, right? We want those to cancel out. So moles of SB has to be on the bottom here. And then how are we gonna figure this out? Well, the molar mass. So now we're going from moles to grams of SB. So the molar mass of SB is gonna be what we're, what we're using. Where do we find that? That's on our periodic table. So I'll put one mole of SB on the bottom and the molar mass that's found on the, the periodic table on top. Okay, so grams of SB. These moles and moles cancel. And all I have to do is multiply straight across and divide. So I would multiply 106 times two times this value. And then after I multiplied all of that together, then I would divide this by this value. And then once I do that, that actually gives me 76.0 grams SB, okay? So uh, something also to note is your sig figs. So how many sig figs did we have initially? Well, that 106 has three sig figs, so what do we end with? Three sig figs. And that's how you know you did this correctly. So this, is, this was a great question because um, I wanted to show you what you would do when you weren't given your balanced equation. And, and just show you that yes, you still can have a multiple ratio when you're not given a balanced equation. All right, so, all right. <laughs> that was the main thing for stoichiometry word problems. By the way, if you guys are just joining or didn't uh, know about it, I do have a lot, and I mean a lot of resources on stoichiometry. I have a whole playlist on it with, with explaining every single part of it, and it goes in the order that I recommend. Um, so make sure to watch that. And, and then also I do have notes that you can uh, purchase for stoichiometry. It is a complete guide for stoichiometry. It has even more practice problems and information on there that uh, pretty much I included it to the point where you go from grams of, to grams, grams to formula units, and just every single possible variation that I could think of, I included in the notes. So highly recommend doing that. Another thing, um, in the description box, I included more resources for you guys. So if you still need, if you would like more help, uh, whether it be homework help or online tutoring, please check the description box. It is towards the bottom. And uh, essentially what it is, and you'll also see this on the screen, is 
It's called Chegg Study. So Chegg Study is something that I personally used when I was in college, and I do recommend it since it helped me out a lot. Um, I specifically used it to help me out under to help me understand my homework. So I didn't always understand the question, and I wanted to well get help with it so I can you know better understand my homework and do better on my exams. So I do highly recommend checking it out. Um, and just to kind of let you know, just a little disclaimer, if you do decide to purchase, uh, I will get a commission off of it that just goes towards making more videos for you guys. Uh, and yeah, so that's pretty much what I do recommend besides all of the other videos and resources that I, I already have. Now, if you guys didn't get your questions answered this time around, but would like to, which I'm sure you would, uh, what I highly, highly recommend you do, tweet me. So if you don't have a Twitter, make one. Really, it's free. So I highly recommend you do that. I have actually a lot of students who didn't have a Twitter but just decided to make one, and they're happy they did. Why? Because they got their questions answered. So I highly recommend you do that. It literally is $100 worth of tutoring, and I know I was a private tutor for a very long time. So, and you guys are getting this completely for free. So making an account, I mean, yeah. So I, I, I think it just, it, it would be really helpful. Uh, I know if I had that resource when I was a student, I'd be very, very thankful. So I highly recommend just tweeting me throughout the week what question you may have. Once again, this is all for a chance for me to answer them. Um, with the more questions that I do get, I can't, I can't guarantee that I answer every single one, but I do answer as many as I can. And I do also uh, choose people who haven't already been chosen. Okay. So definitely put that on the screen. You're going to see that you can tweet me at hello, Melissa M and put the hashtag ask Melissa Maribel and make sure to include both of those. You can take a picture of your chemistry question. I, I've gotten that and that's really helpful. Um, if you have a specific question and then you could also just tell me the topic like, hey, I don't understand electron configuration. And then I'll, I'll, you know, make a lesson accordingly. I highly recommend that you actually tweet me before Saturday, uh, because on Saturday, I will already have made my lesson. Uh, so definitely do that for a chance for me to answer them on the next live, which is on Sunday. Okay. So besides that, I hope you guys have an awesome week. Uh, and continue to move forward, keep studying, keep moving on, because the semester is going to keep going, and it's going to be over before you know it. All right, guys. So have a lovely rest of your Sunday and an awesome week. See you guys.